You open in your New Testament to uh, Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to start at the end. If you look at the notes in your bulletin, and by the way, on the back side of your sermon outline is a worksheet for this Friday if you'd like to join us in that study. We're going to try to answer the question from the Bible, will there be an increase of demonic activity in the last days? Some of you are already nodding your heads. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, the Bible seems to agree with your agreement, so we'll see what the scriptures actually say. Is that enough time to get to chapter 11, verses 1 through 4? Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are clean, the deaf hear, the dead are raised from up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. That is the answer he gave the disciples of John, who, while in prison, was naturally in the flesh, having doubts, perhaps, that Jesus wasn't the Christ. And the answer he wanted John to hear was, just go tell him what you see and what you hear. Which is why we're going to go back and finish chapter 10. Because Jesus is sending out his 12 apostles, disciples. Because in the first couple of verses, they go from being disciples to apostles because he's going to send them out and to preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. That was their assignment. Jesus was explicit. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. Do not go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans. Go to your fellow Hebrew relatives and friends and neighborhoods and preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And that good news was that Jesus, the Messiah, is here now. There's no need to wait any longer for the coming of Messiah. He's here, and he's preaching, and he is proving his Messiahship by what he just told John's disciples to go tell John. Those are the credentials from the Old Testament of the Messiah proving himself, those miracles. And not coincidentally, that's the same power he gave his 12 apostles to do while they preached the gospel, to heal, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, give sight to the blind. All those same miraculous powers were transferred to these 12 men in the name of Jesus. Two weeks ago, we came down to verse 26. Because Jesus is sending them out as sheep amongst the wolves, he says to them in verse 26, Therefore, do not fear them. Whom? We already talked about that. Those who will talk and persecute. Talk against them and persecute them. Don't be afraid of them. Why? Because of the rest of the verse. There is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be shown. In other words, the message you're about to deliver, friends, is new to them. They've been expecting me, the Christ. I'm here, but they're not fully prepared for the mission that I came to accomplish. I did not come with a sword to drive the Romans out. And in just a minute, to his apostles, he's going to explain 
what sword he did bring. And it's going to shock them and possibly you. So in essence, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid of those wolves. They're just men. They're just men. Don't be afraid of them. Be afraid of God. Trust God. Because God has the power to kill the body and the soul. All they can do is kill you. Well, that's reassuring. <laughs> okay, now I'm ready to go out. Trust God because only he has the authority over your body and your soul. So put your trust and your fear in him, not them. This same notion will be picked up by John the Apostle when he is given the revelation in 12 11 of Revelation, they did not love their life even when faced with death. Those who faced death during the tribulation loved God more than their own lives. And that's what Jesus is setting up with these 12 men now. So let's look at these verses in the rest of this chapter 10 and let's bring it all together. Now, as the subtitle suggests, these phrases, these sentences only make sense in context. Remember to whom Jesus is speaking. He is talking to the 12 men he's sending out to carry the message of the kingdom of heaven. That's the people he's talking to. He's talking about the lost sheep of Israel. He's not talking to the church. This isn't the gospel of salvation. This is the good news that the Messiah is here. So get ready for a change. You will notice also, he repeats two more times. Do not be afraid. We just read it in verse 26. Look down at verse 28. He says it again. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. He repeats it again in verse 31. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now, in context, that will make sense. But I want you to see that as we face uncertain times in these last days, Jesus is telling us the same thing by inference. Don't be afraid. That's why I read Psalm 9. A reassuring word from the Old Testament that God is still in control. He knows exactly what he is doing. Verse 26. Your message may not be known yet, but it will. Go preach it. Verse 27. Jesus is beginning to contrast light and darkness. And whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetop. In other words, it's not a secret anymore. Go preach it. What? The gospel of the kingdom of heaven, which is what? Jesus is Messiah, and he's here now. Verse 28. Fear God. Let's read it as it's written. And do not fear those who kill the body, but not kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the person you should be afraid of, the ultimate judge. Now, if you look up the word kill, it means to destroy. God is saying to his servants, don't be afraid of these guys. The worst they can do is kill you. Don't be afraid as a Marine. The worst they can do. <laughs> fear God. Now, isn't that reassuring, Danny? No. God is telling his ambassadors, don't be afraid. Verse 29. Are you not? Excuse, excuse me. Are not? Two sparrows sold for a copper coin, 
and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will, but every hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You're more valuable than many sparrows. Well, that may have made sense to them. What I see there is, Nolan, I know more about you than you know about yourself. That's what I see. He's telling them, don't be afraid of those guys because in the sacrificial system, you could take a sparrow if you could not afford a more expensive bird or a lamb or an ox. God would accept as a sacrifice a sparrow. And you're more valuable than that. In fact, he knows how many hairs on your head there are. And for some of us, that's getting less and less as the days go by. Can you imagine how much trivia God has to keep in order just to keep up with us? But the fearful thing is he really does know us. And what Jesus is saying, you are valuable. That's why he's keeping track of all this stuff. So valuable that the blood of his very son was spent to redeem you. Verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Clear enough. If they confess Jesus as Messiah, Jesus will confess them to the Father. If they deny that, then he will deny them. In other words, this is the line in the sand that he's about to explain as the verses unfold following this. Jesus is the dividing line between them and us, between those who will be and those who will never be. Verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. That's scary. Let him explain. Let him quote Micah, the prophet, to help us understand the instruction he's giving to his apostles to whom he is sending out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Verse 35. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Remember the context. He is telling them to go out amongst the wolves and don't be afraid. I'm sending you on a mission to preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Don't be fearful of them. But the line of demarcation between those who will receive is belief, confession. Confession is critical. This is why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart. It is important for us to tell the Lord what we believe. It's less important to tell somebody else. It's most important to tell him, I believe in you, said you to him. Hopefully, he said to you, I know you're born again. You are a new creation. You're one of mine. Because of your confession, welcome. You see, that's the critical line. And so you can see the women who may have been hearing 
gathered around the 12 who are about to go out and preach this gospel, clutching their kids. What? You're going to bring strife in my own household? You're not bringing peace? You're bringing a sword? If you're going to bring a sword, go get the Romans and drive them out of here. And Jesus says, no, that's not what the message is all about. The message is all about whether you believe in me or not. That's the message. That's the line you must cross. That is repentance. See, repentance is not just changing your direction. That's what I was told for decades. Repentance is be going one way away from God, and you go, oh, that's right, and turn and go back the other way toward God. That's what happens when you repent. Your mind changes. That changes your direction. So from God's point of view, when he looks down upon your repentance, he sees you change your mindset. I don't know how you were when you were 20. I don't know how you're going to be when you turn 20, but I'll guess. I argued with everything in the Bible. Well, that just can't be right. That just can't be the way it is. That cannot be true. With any help, I picked up Mom's King James Bible, and only the older ladies in here will know this story. I had to unzip it. Remember those? <laughs> Opened it up. Smelled kind of funny because it had been zipped shut for a long time. And I started reading all the begats, and so-and-so begats it, and begat. And since I had no idea what the word begat meant, I said, well, if the rest of the book is like this, who needs it? That was a huge mistake. Don't do it. <laughs> so what God is saying, read it, understand it, and do it. It wasn't until I was 17 that I realized Jesus died for me. That's when repentance took hold. My mind got changed. My heart got transformed. And that's when I began to strive to work and live for him. That's when I had to work hard to undo all my public education. It was a trial. I can remember my first psychology class in university right in the introduction ever since man climbed out of the trees and lost his tail he had psychological problems well <laughs> duh he should have kept the tail I was newly born again and I remember thinking to myself this is going to be a very long semester if the premise of the book is on this, this is going to be a tough class. Well, I failed. <laughs> God is saying to his apostles, which by the way means sent out, one who is sent out. That's why they went from being disciples to apostles. That's why... Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus. He wanted another apostle, someone to send to the Gentiles. Do you see the irony of that? Our God is just way beyond smart. Here is a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, so committed to Judaism, he is persecuting Christians. By the way, they weren't called Christians yet. Followers of the way is what they were called. In Paul's mind, blasphemers, heretics, arresting them, getting them stoned like he held the coats for the guys who stoned Stephen. He's on his way to Damascus to get some more. I'm going to get some more, and I'm going to bring them back to Jerusalem. We're going to kill them too. Well, guess what? Jesus, who had already ascended into heaven, got up off of his right hand seat with the Father, went down there and said, no. Well, he said more than that. It's in Acts chapter 9. Read it for yourself. Knocked 
Paul to the ground. And then he sent them, sent him, this Hebrew of Hebrew, to the Gentiles. Wouldn't it make more sense to send a man who's been studying to be a rabbi to the Jews? Not in the mind of the God, because what? His ways are not our ways. His thinking are not our thinking. So he takes this committed Jewish fanatic and makes him one of the greatest preachers that ever lived. It is Paul who explains a lot of what Jesus taught in his letters to the churches. It's he that goes back and gives us context of all the other quotes in the Bible, like Micah, where Jesus says, when I come, I'm here, and I'm going to be the dividing line between fathers and sons, daughters and moms, daughters-in-laws, and mothers-in-laws. I'm going to be the line those who both believe in me will get along just fine. Those who are separated by faith won't get along. And I know, if I look at your face, you have experienced some of this. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I'm certain there are many in this room who have closer friends in the family of God than you do in your blood family because of the kindred heart of two people who believe. Now, watch how Jesus pulls this all together. I want you to see how he brings everything together with, it's a choice. Let's read the rest of the chapter. And I'm not going to stop at chapter 10. I'm going to go right through and read as if chapter 11 is not even in there. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me, him who sent me. Now let's read it exactly the way it's written. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, and they said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Why did he tack that on? Because he's the dividing line. He's the line in the sand. He's the difference between family getting together and not getting together. If you're not for Jesus, you are against. That's just the way it is. That's what separates sheep from goats. Notice all the choices. The choice to believe is up to the individual. The disciples who are now apostles sent out, they had to choose to preach or not preach. Now they could have just gone off out into a village, sat under a tree, waited. You know what? He might be back by now. I'll just go back. Uh -uh. They chose to preach. You can choose to be afraid or choose not to be afraid. You can choose to be angry or not to be angry. By the way, nobody can make you angry. You choose.
to being mad. You can either choose to believe or choose not to believe. You can either take up your cross or don't. It's your choice. You can either choose to hang on to your life and lose it or give it freely to the Lord and gain it. Your choice. You can choose to receive Jesus as Savior, King, and Lord, or not. You can receive a prophet, the words of truth, or ignore them. You can choose to receive the words of a righteous person, parentheses, a preacher, not, not, not that all of us are righteous, but the righteous words of God are not your choice. You can choose to give a cup of water to somebody or not. It's your choice. You see, God gave Adam and Eve a choice. Eat of all the fruit in the garden, but not that one. Eat anything you want, but not that one. Choice. And they chose to eat of the forbidden fruit. Now, if you're thinking, if you were there, you would have definitely, you're wrong. Because how is that fruit described? Pleasant to the eye. You, I can just see them. And then the tempter. You know, the only reason he doesn't want you to eat that is because he knows when you do, you're going to become like him. (coughs) Instantly, she knew, and instantly, Adam knew, oops. Because that's when they noticed they were naked and they were ashamed. And they covered themselves in what was closest to be around, fig leaves. How many in this room have ever picked figs off a fig tree? How uncomfortable was your entire body after feeling the underside of a fig leaf? Ouch. I can just see God coming in and going, ooh. That's not what I had in mind. So he prepared for them a set of lamb wool seat covers. And there, isn't that better? So from the beginning, temptation won out. The serpent interceded and got their attention. And won that battle. But immediately, God was there to reconcile. He is still in the business of reconciliation. That is why the duty has fallen to us to go preach the gospel. Not the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus has already come, established his Messiahship, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. The gospel we preach is the gospel of salvation, which is very simple. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and those who believe that are saved. Simple and difficult. Because as soon as you say, I believe, life gets miserable for at least a week. Because all your friends, remember back then? Now, some of you, it's been so long ago, you'll have to stop and think. The first seven days after I said I believe were the worst seven days of my teenage years. Because now all my old friends said, who in the world are you? What? You know the religion's for... I've heard them all. Go ahead. That one's not new. 
Ring a bell? And then day eight. Ironically, day eight in Scripture is the new beginning. The new day. It started to come together. And this is what he is calling us to be. Christianity is being the person God created us to be. True, righteous image bearers of him. The ouch part, the painful part, is the pruning. Where God's going around to each one of us and saying, I need to get rid of this to conform you to the image of my son. And some of us are going, ow, that really hurt. Because we grew accustomed. We grew painfully accustomed to sin. And God is saying, that has to go. The last thing I want you to remember is what he said through the Apostle Paul. It has to do with the confessing us to the Father. Forgive. Even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Amen?